Welcome to CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I know there's a number of folks who are joining us this morning in the room here. I'm grateful to you all. I see some familiar faces, and, uh, and I'm always amazed that you guys keep coming back for more. It's a, it's a very exciting to have a life in which you get to spend your time sorting out how the Department of Homeland Security spends its contract dollars. And uh, this is the dream of every child in America, I think, so uh, I get to, to, to live it. Um, welcome as well to those of you who are joining us on the web. Uh, I'm going to take a few minutes to uh, uh, remind you that if you are joining us on the web, you won't actually be able to see the charts that we're showing this morning unless you scroll down and download the presentation. If you're actually looking at the page uh, that has this event on it, um, on the right-hand side there's a little section called files and underneath that is presentation. It's a PDF file. Uh, you can download that and open it, and then you can follow along. We'll let you know what chart number we're on uh, as we go. Um, but uh, uh, if you're just watching the web, you'll see our smiling faces, but, uh, but not the actual data. Uh, also, for those of you who have the report, most of the charts are in the report. Uh, you'll be able to download the presentation as well if you just want to have the charts in, in place. Uh, there are a few charts that are not in the report. We'll let you know, though, which page we're on so that you can follow along as well and make sure you get your notes uh, in the right place. I would also ask you to um, silence your cell phones and Blackberries. Um, I'm going to leave mine on uh, because uh, if you are joining us on the web and you want to give us feedback and questions as we go, uh, my uh, email address will be on at the end and in the past we've had uh, good success with people sending in uh, questions by email uh, as well as questions from the audience as we go. Um, we're here today to talk about the Defense De of Home the Department of Homeland Security's contract spending and the supporting industrial base. And uh, joining me on the stage here is Guy Benari. He's the Deputy Director of the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group here at CSIS. I'm the Director. I want to thank, uh, as we stand up here today, particularly the two lead authors of this report, Priscilla Herman and Greg Sanders, who are with us here today. They did an incredible job of pulling together a huge amount of data and analyzing and sorting it. Uh, for an agency that doesn't have a long history of, of doing this sort of thing. Uh, we also had some tremendous contributions from our research, uh, uh, researchers here, uh, Reed Livergood, David Morrow, Ryan Crotty, and Nick Lombardo, uh, and a tremendous amount of support from the Homeland Security team here at CSIS led by uh, Ozzie Nelson. So it's been a, a true group effort as we pull this all together here today. Um, I'm going to start the presentation here, and then I'm going to sit down see, there's actually a thing here called slideshow. From beginning, that sounds like a good plan. All right. And uh, those of you who are on the left side, uh, you'll be able to see Guy much better than me. I think you probably, you're actually on your right, my left. You probably made that by choice, so that's fine. Uh, but if you need to move, uh, feel free to do so. Morning, everybody. I'll just throw in one, one other comment before we kick off the actual presentation. Uh, for those of you who've been following our, our work for the last few years, this is actually uh, another in a series of reports that we uh, have put out um, using primarily FPDS, the Federal Procurement Data System, as the data source to track contract trends in various um, segments of the federal uh, contracting market as well as specific government agencies and departments. Uh, so we started this series with uh, uh, a number of reports actually on the professional services industrial base and um, the most recent one that we had in the series was on DOD contracting trends um, which came out in May. So uh, this will be the third topic if you will in this series and we're planning another one or two at least in the coming months, uh, and those will probably be tracking contracting trends in NASA and the Department of Energy, um, which together with DOD are actually about 75 percent of probably the, the contracting market. Um, and so um, hope to see you at next events as well in the series as we continue to uh, look at the data and, uh, and analyze it. I think it's also worth noting that we provided DHS an opportunity to review our data and analysis and, uh, and our presentations. Uh, 
Um, we, uh, they provided us some, some um, uh, comments and we incorporated their, uh, much of their feedback as well. Uh, but all of the data and the findings and the conclusions and, and comments that we'll make here today are totally CSIS's uh, responsibility. Um, all of this is from public data. Uh, the public data gets better over time as we've been working with it over the last uh, seven or eight years. It's gotten tremendously better. Uh, over the last couple years, there's actually been an attempt by this administration to use the federal procurement data system as a management tool out of OMB and the Office of Federal Procurement Policy. And there's no motivation for accurate data entry like having the results of your data entry be the basis on which your agency is judged. And so we've seen some, some nice new improvements and we'll talk about some of those improvements here uh, today. Um, this is actually about DHS, but I think before we talk just about the department, it's really useful to remember that only about half of the Homeland Security spending by the federal government is done by the Department of Homeland Security. And what this chart reflects is actually the distribution of Homeland Security funding across the federal government. Uh, the top line, the blue line, is the DHS line and the billions of dollars are over on the left-hand side. So you can see it's about $36 billion in, in the FY11 request uh, for DHS. But, and that's about half of the total federal spending on Homeland Security. The Department of Defense has more than a, a fourth uh, of the total as well uh, for Homeland Defense and related activities. And then there are several other large agencies. They don't look large on this chart. They're down at the bottom in the three to $5 billion range. Uh, Health and Human Services, the Justice Department, uh, the State Department, and the Department of Energy. And they're actually, almost every agency has some share of Homeland Security spending. The rest of this report is going to focus only on DHS, but it's pretty useful to keep in mind that half of the Homeland Security spending in the federal government is in other agencies. Now we'll go, this is chart four, this is uh, page six in your report. Uh, from here on, it, it's all Department of Homeland Security. What this chart shows you is the total outlays of the department. You can see it's $45 billion in, in 2010. And by the way, while we've got FY11 data on the previous chart, there's no uh, uh, FY11 contract data yet available. So this FY10 is the last year because we're obviously still in fiscal year 11. Uh, so FY10 is the last year in which we have uh, the data. So you've got about $45 billion of total outlays by the Department of Homeland Security. Roughly 14 billion of that is on contract. The other 31 billion is spent both on non-contract outlays, including a significant amount of grants to state and local governments. Now, many of you come from companies who actually pursue contracts that are funded by those grants, but those contracts are issued by the state and local government uh, activities who are the beneficiaries of those grants uh, and the recipients of those grants. And we don't have a database that allows us to track the contract uh, trail uh, from those grants. And so what, what you have here is just federal contracts, if you will, uh, from the DHS level. And you can see that the percentages roughly have been fairly even over time. That's that line across the middle, ranging from 30 to 36 or 35 percent over the course of time. You also see, of course, that Homeland Security spending is driven very much by disasters and events because you got a very nice big Katrina bump in the middle of this chart there. Um, it goes up a lot in, in 2005. Those of you who remember Hurricane Katrina, it hit at the end of August in 2005, so you only had a month left in that fiscal year. There was an initial 2005 supplemental uh, that was in place, but a lot of additional funding was put in place in 2006. And so while we do have supplemental funding included in this contract data, FPDS does not allow us to separate out contracts that are funded by supplementals from contracts that are funded by the base budget. So they're all mixed in together here. Let's go to the next chart. So this chart just gives you a, a bit of an overview into how we, we cut the data for this particular brief. Uh, for those of you who know the federal procurement data system, you know that it is a very rich uh, database. Uh, there might be an issue or two here and there with uh, uh, the accuracy of the data or uh, uh, some errors in entry or in reporting, uh, but it's the best we have. It's the only source we have really for, for this type of data, and you can uh, uh, cut data for any particular agency or department in, in very, very many ways. 
so these are what we consider to be some of the, the, the key uh, sort of uh, uh, issues to tackle when looking at contract spending. Um, we'll look first of all at overall spending and break it down into product services and research and development. Uh, we're going to look then by individual DHS components, um, FEMA, Coast Guard, etc., and again, uh, break those down into product services and R&D. Um, we'll look at some uh, department-wide contract characteristics, uh, like level of competition, the funding mechanisms, and the contract types that uh, DHS uses to contract out to the uh, private sector. And then the last bit that we'll be looking at today uh, looks at the supply side or the industrial base that supports DHS. Um, we'll look at how many contractors there are, um, how uh, they break down into small, medium, and large companies, and then we'll look at some of the top contractors over time and see how that list has changed and in some ways stayed the same um, over the course of the study period. By the way, we look at, uh, for this report, although DHS was set up in 2002, um, well, officially really in 2003, um, we looked at the period starting in 2004 just because the first two years of, of activity were really outliers. It was a lot of sort of uh, startup programs and, uh, and sort of initiation activities uh, that sort of skewed the data a little bit. And so we thought just to get a, a, a more uh, a realistic trend over time, we started with 2004 and, as David said, went through 2010, the last year for which uh, a full year's worth of data is available. That uh, chart is, is not in your book, but the next one, uh, chart six, is on page eight. Oh, sorry, David. One more comment here on the previous chart. Um, obviously, there's many more ways to cut this data, and we're happy to do that uh, if there are uh, issues that, that uh, some of you are interested in in particular. Some of your companies might be interested in looking at the data a little differently. We're very happy to sit down and, and uh, work the database uh, a little more and, and draw out. Um, other issues that might be uh, more interesting for, for our audience. So please send us in your comments or, or uh, our sort of requests for, for additional runs. Yeah, we can slice this a thousand ways and we love to see the results. But it makes for a very thick uh, and potentially less interesting uh, report. So, um, so page uh, eight in your book, chart six. I think you're gonna... Oh, yes. Um, Yes, so here we are with the first sort of grand overview of, of overall contract spending. Uh, again, broken down by products, services, R&D, and what immediately obviously leaps out is that DHS is primarily a services contracting department um, with uh, something like two-thirds of the uh, contract spending spent on, on services in any particular year. Again, the jump in 2006, uh, primarily Katrina-driven, um, and the other interesting issue that we'll get into in a little more detail, I mean, we'll get into all of this in a, a lot more detail, but for right now, um, you look at the relatively small role that R&D uh, contracting plays for DHS. And the next chart is really just the previous slide, but uh, showing you the, the shares of each of the components, products, services, and R&D in the overall uh, uh, DHS contracting budget. Um, and again, with services playing, playing consistently the, the, the major role in the contracting, uh, between two-thirds and 70 percent uh, spent on that. The other thing that's interesting here is if you look at the, uh, the trends, they've been pretty stable over the last three, four years um, on, on all three categories. Now, uh, chart eight, it's page 13 in your book. Uh, we now break down uh, the contract spending by the six key components of DHS that we have in place. Uh, that's Customs and Border Patrol, uh, TSA, the Federal Emergency Management uh, Administration, uh, the U.S. Coast Guard, um, uh, ICE, and the Office of the Secretary, which includes a host of smaller entities. Um, we don't have, uh, uh, we have on, on this chart also the category of other DHS, that's the smaller groups. Probably the biggest part of that is the U.S. Selective Service, uh, which does do some contract dollars. Uh, but you can see from the colors on the chart that, uh, that in fact, 
each of these components tends to have a, very, a fairly stable amount of contract dollars uh, spent year over year, um, even though the, the totals change. The two big differences are the light green, which is FEMA, and you can see the huge bump from FEMA in Katrina in 05 and 06, and a little bit of a bump in, uh, in 09 from, uh, from, or in 08 and 09 from Gustav and Ike. Um, the other biggest change, if you will, is the uh, kind of reddish below the light green, and that's the office of the secretary. That's driven, and we'll spend a little more time on that because the, the amount of growth there is so enormous in terms of a percentage basis. We're going to spend a little more time on, on the com subcomponents of that uh, as we look forward. Now, we'll go to chart 9, uh, page 16 in your book. And here we're back to the this breakdown of product services and R&D. We'll look at each of these categories a little more closely, starting with products. Um, you'll note that we, we've dropped the other category here. We're really just looking at those, uh, those six components uh, that are the main components when it comes to contracting at DHS. And again, the story here is, is one of uh, relative stability for most of the components. And with, again, FEMA being the exception, um, especially in, in uh, disaster years, and especially at the front end, I guess, of the disaster. A lot of trailers in that uh, big bright green package right there. Um, chart 10, page 18 in your book, is spending on services contracts. And it's useful to note the scales on these are changing. You know, for the overall one, it was a $20 billion scale. For, for the products one, it was a $5 billion scale. Uh, for services now, $14 billion is at the top of the chart, so you get a sense of the relative proportions, if you will. Spending by services shows some of the same trends that we saw in the overall spending. Uh, large swings in FEMA related, by and large, to natural disasters. Uh, the largest area of growth is in the Office of the Secretary, and that's driven by, uh, again, an, a number of issues that we'll uh, accommodate earlier. Uh, fair amount of stability in terms of service spending dollars in the other components, if you will. Uh, dramatic drop towards the end in, uh, in FEMA in FY10, uh, uh, driven in part by the fact that there were no large natural disasters that year. And, uh, or at least not that uh, drove their spending. Also um, ref uh, uh, um, affected by a significant amount of deobligation of, uh, of prior year FEMA funds. And that's not picked up in uh, FPDS, but it is part of the explanation for the changes, if you will. Uh, the next chart, which is uh, chart 11, and in your book it's page, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this next chart's actually not in your book. So uh, you won't find it in your, in your book. This is some a of, bonus for coming in. Actually. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some of you are familiar with the way in which we break down services contract dollars because our, our original work here is on services contracting. And we have these categories of services, if you will, starting at the bottom, R&D, which the Federal Procurement Data System counts as a service. Um, uh, Equipment-related services, facilities-related services, FRS, uh, information and communications technology, uh, professional administrative and management services, PAMS, which is almost always the largest section of services contracts, uh, medical services and other services. Some of these are not categories we actually pick up in our services contracts report. We don't, medical, for instance, we don't actually include there, uh, but we did include it here so we'd have the full picture. And what you see is that actually uh, it, DHS is, is not unexpected in terms of its distribution. Pretty small amount on R&D uh, related at the bottom, um, and we actually include, and I'll mention this uh, again later, R&D management services as opposed to actual R&D in the professional administrative and management services category rather than in the R&D, which is contracts for actual research and development. So we, we break that category down a little differently than either DHS or, or FPDS does. A lot on equipment and facilities related, not surprising because that's what uh, DHS needs a lot of its assistance. And of course the largest amount on professional and management services, if you will. The next chart that's in your book on page 20 is chart 12, and that's our spending on R&D. Now the, the scale, if you will, is just a billion dollars on the left-hand side, and you see the breakdown by component. Here there's a significant amount of variability changing over time, and this is primarily driven by individual large programs and when, they, when the dollars get obligated under contracts for them. Um, so that, for instance, the, uh, uh, the Office of the Secretary, uh, a large jump that you see there, uh, in between the um, uh, about 100 million in 07 and 08 and up to 200 million in 09 and 10 are driven by specific 
programs that, uh, that are put in place there, including those from uh, the Federal Protective Service. And what's, what's very interesting here as well is that um, while professional services or we, we count R&D support services as, as services as opposed to actual R&D, um, there's, there's not really a significant, uh, there's a lot, sorry, of variation in those as well. It, we didn't break it out in the previous chart nor in this one, uh, but in fact they, the DHS spends about on average twice as much a year on R&D support as it does on actual R&D. Uh, which was surprising. We, when I mean, we track a lot of defense uh, contracts, and it's about 14 to one uh, in actual R&D versus uh, R&D support and management services in DoD. Here, it's about one to two. With for every dollar spent on actual R&D, there's two spent on R&D support. Um, we we probably need to do a little more research on on why that happens, but uh, but that's an interesting. Uh, point there. Another quick methodological note um, is that FPDS does not capture classified contracts, and so if there's any uh, classified R&D, it won't show up in the numbers here. We don't think that's a large number. It is for DOD, obviously. For DHS, that's probably a lot smaller, but the numbers could be bigger for R&D uh, if you counted the classified work as well. I think it's also useful to note, you know, if, if we go back to, to chart 7, page 9 in your in your book, R&D looks like a tiny little part of this whole contracting exercise, right? It's just that little line down at the bottom. It's always less than 10 percent. Uh, but from a, a business point of view and from a supporting the government point of view, um, you know, these are often 50 million, 100 million, 150 million dollar contracts. These are not trivial business areas to be tracking and, and, and going after. Uh, from the point of view of business. And you'll see when we get to the distribution of companies involved here um, that, in fact, businesses like this or, or, or money like this, funding like this in R&D actually provides a very rich marketing opportunity for t particularly for medium-sized technology businesses. The uh, next chart, it's chart 13, it's page 22 in your book. I mentioned that we would look specifically at the Office of the Secretary because this has had a tremendous growth rate uh, over the period of time since the formation of the Department of Homeland Security, from about uh, $300 million worth of contracts in 2004 to $3 billion of contracts by 2010. That's a very substantial growth rate. That's a, uh, the, over the last three years alone, it's been a 28 percent per year compound annual growth rate in terms of funding. This is driven by two things. One is um, centrally funded DHS-wide activities often end up in this Office of the Secretary of Will, the, the central procurement uh, funds here for large IT programs that reach across uh, DHS are often funded in the Office of the Secretary, and there have been more of those over the last couple of years. The second is organizational changes. Periodically, an organization will go from being a separate reporting activity to being put under the Office of the Secretary for Management Purposes, the most recent of which was Federal Protective Services, which includes, of course, an awful lot of security contractors for guarding the buildings around, uh, around the, the U.S., uh, and that's what led in large part to that billion-dollar increase between 09 and 10. Um, so it's not as if it's a new market. It's redistributed from elsewhere inside DHS. Um, now we'll go to chart 14, which is page 24 in your book. And this is really one of the, the, the really good news charts for, for us, at least, looking at, at the contract spending in Homeland Security. Um, just looking at, at where the growth has been, it's really been in the category of competition with multiple offers. And if you, you consider the fact that uh, you're more likely to get a better price and more innovation when there's more competition, this is, this is good news for DHS. It means that the market is, is vibrant. There's uh, companies there bidding on every or on a large amount of the, the contracts, multiple uh, companies bidding on each contract, uh, uh, DHS's ability to negotiate a better deal for, for it and for the taxpayer increases as a result of that. Uh, in parallel, the, the contracts uh, that have no competition have been going down. Again, a good story there uh, for DHS. Um, there are fewer, uh, I guess uh, you can put it that way, fewer contracts um, where DHS is limited to just the one sole source. Another category here that's worth looking at, and we will do a little more of that, is the unlabeled category. Um, 
part of that is not necessarily that it's unlabeled in FPDS. It might be uh, that it's labeled erroneously. And if we catch, for example, a contract that is labeled as competed, but there are no bids, uh, we will count that as an error and throw that in the unlabeled category. Uh, same thing if there's a contract that says it's competed to multiple uh, uh, companies and we see there's, uh, there's one company, we'll, we'll label that as erroneous as well. Um, probably dig a little deeper into there to, to see what, uh, what the reasons for that are. But again, there's a lot of just data entry errors there. Uh, that distribution of, of categories that have problems with them is about consistent for DHS as it is with other agencies. That's been uh, 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 an area I think that is going to get some increasing focus from inside the government. Obviously, uh, you know, this administration has put a strong premium, as virtually every administration does, on increasing competition. This is the first time, though, that the federal procurement data system is being used as part of the evaluation of how well agencies are performing on competition. And so we think that's partially responsible uh, for uh, the improvement here, if you will. Um, chart 15, page 26 in your book, is a different way of looking at overall contracting. This is, we, we call this funding mechanism. It doesn't really have a, a, a commonly accepted terminology. And what we really mean here is, is the contract categorized as a fixed price contract, as a cost reimbursable contract, as a time and materials contract, and then there are a couple of other categories, something called combination, uh, the same unlabeled, which really means inconsistently labeled, and of course the uh, famous category called other. Um, one of the intriguing things here is that there has also been an, an emphasis in the administration on increasing the amount of work that's done under fixed price contracts. You can see the results of that reflected here with an increase in fixed price uh, year over year over the last four years inside the Department of Homeland Security. Um, there's also been a slight decrease in cost reimbursable, a slight increase in time and materials. Some of that comes from changes at the top of this chart. Uh, the white part, which is what we call unlabeled, goes from 1.6 billion in 09 to 700 million in 10. That's a big drop. That's a drop because of an effort to try to reduce the amount in there. Similarly, with combination, which went from a billion dollars in 08 uh, down to almost nothing in by FY10. But that isn't because those contracts cease to exist. They've now been better categorized, and so they've been moved into the other categories of fixed price or cost reimbursable or time and materials. And the, many of you who have complex contracts with a large number of contract line items know that some of those will, in fact, be fixed price and others will be cost reimbursable. The federal procurement data system has a counting rule here. It basically says add up the expected dollar value of all of the contract line item numbers and allocate the, the uh, category based on the largest dollar value. So you could have, in fact, a $100 million contract here, 60% of which is fixed price, 40% of which is cost reimbursable. If they calculate it correctly, it all shows up here as fixed price. That's one of the anomalies inside the data uh, that we'd love to see fixed. And, and uh, of course, the only way that's going to be fixed is if people spend more time on uh, data entry. Um, and that's not free. Um, the next chart, chart 16 on page 27, uh, takes the third, our third way of looking at contracts, uh, and that's breaking it down, assuming I can turn my page and actually see it here. Breaking it down by contract vehicle. Here again, you see some elements of stability, but some pretty significant changes over time. The dark blue at the bottom is definitive contracts. And of course, everybody would love to have a definitized contract with clearly defined requirements and a clean scope of work and, and clean deliverables, et cetera. Um, and we all know that sometimes reality gets in the way of that. But you can see a pretty significant growth in definitive, definitive contracts in DHS over the last four years. You can similarly see a pretty significant reduction in the big dark green at the bottom in the use of purchase orders. And that's largely because of an increase in the use of the indefinite delivery vehicles at the top, the schedules and the, and the blanket purchasing agreements uh, in, in particular. Um, and so we track these over time just because they're indications of two things. One is what kind of vehicles are they using? And from the point of view of, of, uh, of business, it's important to know uh, where the trends are for the agency. Again, we can break this all down also by component. Um, so we can give you this for, for what Customs and Border Patrol puts in place or what Coast Guard uses, et cetera. Uh, we don't do this in this book, but that's available in, uh, in, in a later briefing. 
So the, the okay. next chart is 17 on page 30. Guy. And, and here we're starting uh, our look at the supply side, if you will, of the contracting uh, market at DHS, the, um, the industrial base. Uh, first, uh, just a quick methodological note. These, uh, these, the data we have for these, uh, these categories end in 2009, um, certainly for the top 20, not for the uh, yes and for all of them actually, uh, the rest of the slide deck. Uh, that's because we're going beyond FPDS here to look at company numbers, um, to cross-check, and to roll up companies that include a multitude of uh, sister and daughter companies. Uh, we want to capture all of that as, as well as we possibly can, and the numbers just take a little longer to be released and to get crunched. And so the latest year for which we have a full year's worth of data available is 2009. Right, can I add one thing there? We actually have some good news. Our, our crack analytic team has come up with some new methodologies to tackle this. And this will be the last report we issue where there's a one-year lag between the company listing and the contract listing. So the next one, when we release our, uh, our annual update of, uh, of overall federal services contracts, um, we'll have, at that point, lined up companies and uh, mm -hmm and contract data, and we should be able to do that from here forward. Um, it plagues us to have a one-year gap in our data, and so it's really refreshing that we can be able to close that. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but so, so what we've done here, rather than a trend line, is, is show you the, the top 20 companies by value uh, in obligated dollars um, for 2005 and 2009, and it just really uh, highlights the dynamic nature of, of the, the DHS contracting world um, in terms of, of who makes up the, the, the top 20 list every year. 2005, again, was sort of the start of the, the Katrina year, and you can really see that, that manifest in the top 20. The companies with the largest amount of dollars from DHS that year were the companies that sold DHS trailers, temporary housing, and other disaster response-related products and services. Um, the, the shift to 2009, or in the, the interim years, of course, saw much less spent on uh, disaster response and recovery. And you really see the rise, if you will, of the, the IT contractors and the emergence of some of the big defense contractors um, in the Homeland Security domain. Your Lockheed Martins, your uh, General Dynamics, your Boeings, your Northrop Grumman's side by side with um, your Unisys, your Accenture, your Siemens, your uh, uh, computer science corporations. Um, obviously, there, even in the defense uh, market, there's a lot of overlap between the defense sort of uh, hardware manufacturers and the, the IT uh, companies. The, all of the big defense companies now have large IT components. Um, what's interesting in Homeland Security is that you see the more sort of uh, commercially oriented IT companies like Siemens, uh, like HP, show up as big players in, in uh, 2009. There are a couple of important notes in terms of the numbers on this chart, though. First of all, this is only prime contract dollars. That's right. And so it doesn't reflect the distribution of those kind prime contract dollars of how much of that money is spent by the prime contractor themselves and how much is spent on subcontractors because the federal procurement data system does not yet have, and nor is there another good public source of subcontractor data. The government says they're working on that. They've got some internal data. We don't have access to that. Uh, we look forward to that. The second is that this will not match up with what the companies show on their own books as revenue associated with Homeland Security or with DHS, in part because of the subcontractor data question, in part sometimes because of the way in which the government categorizes. Uh, we've seen a number of cases where a company will book a contract as a service. The government's booking it as a product. And uh, we don't actually, one of our rules is we don't try to change the government's data. We try to change the way they enter their data, but we don't go back and actually change their data for them. So you'll find discrepancies between what companies put in their statements and reports and what we show as the numbers. I would actually suggest that every company ought to know what the federal procurement data system shows as its prime contract dollars because it's a useful reflection for you to see what is in the, uh, the public domain with regard to that. 
and, uh, and we think that that's a useful thing for every company to be aware of. Just one last quick comment here on, on this slide still. We've done a little bit of basic math for, for you at the bottom of each of the, the right hand most columns for each year. And if you'll just take a minute to, to, to look at that, it'll tell you that the share of the top 20s, uh, the top 20 companies' uh, market, DHS market, went from about a half to about a third. And that's, that's a very interesting industrial base issue for us uh, because it really tells you that there's more players playing at the sort of uh, mid and lower tiers of the market. It's not necessarily the largest uh, contractors capturing the, the largest share anymore. And you'll see that in the next couple of charts. Chart 18 is on page 31. Right, and this one just shows you the split into small, medium, and large companies uh, by number of companies. Um, and so, relatively straightforward, there are very few really large companies, and by large, by the way, we mean companies with total revenues, uh, annual revenues of $3 billion and, and above. And so there's, uh, there were about 90 of those um, in uh, uh, 2009. Just for comparison's sake, uh, in the DOD world, there are about 200, um, again, for 2009, 2010. Um, Small companies form the majority of the industrial base. Again, not really a surprise there. Um, and by the way, small companies for us, we just go by the FPDS definition, which follows the Small Business Administration's definitions of what constitutes a small company. So there's really no judgment on our part here. We just take the, the FPDS uh, uh, label uh, as it is. And medium-sized companies are anywhere in between. Now, we realize that that's a pretty big uh, spread there. It's uh, anything between about 20 million to 3 billion. Uh, we've made some attempts in other, uh, other reports to break down the mid-tier into sort of uh, 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 subcategories as well, and we can do that for, for this, uh, uh, this mid-tier as well. We haven't done it for this report, but that's another way to cut the data if, if more granularity is interesting. Chart 19 on, on page 32 looks at the same data, but now instead of by number of contract actions, it's by the dollar value of the contracts. This is a, a more familiar distribution, if you will. Uh, large companies, that is those with over $3 billion in annual revenue, are at the top, uh, over $5 billion a year the last couple of years, uh, but a, a stable share, not a growing share of the overall market. Uh, the small companies at the bottom have ha also had a growth, and in fact that growth has been, uh, has been pretty substantial, uh, measurable over the last couple of years from 4.1 billion in 07 uh, to 4.5 billion in 09. We think the 10 number is also up over the 4.5 billion. Um, and the mid-sized companies are maintaining a fairly stable share here. Uh, this is in contrast to what you would see. This similar chart, if you will, for the Defense Department shows a growing share going to the, top, to the largest companies and a shrinking share to the middle tier companies. You don't see that same trend in DHS. I think that's a reflection of a number of things. One is the broad diversity of the components and the various types of activities that they pursue. The second is the emphasis on competition uh, that we saw earlier in the competitive contracts data. And, uh, and I think if you combine those together, it's clear that from a DHS point of view, there's a fairly stable uh, relationship and it's actually uh, quite uh, interesting to see this compared to the Defense Department. That concludes our data charts. Um, I've got a summary chart up there now. It's chart 20. It's not in your book, so you'll actually uh, either have to uh, uh, pay attention or, uh, or pretend to be reading your book. Uh, but, uh, but we actually wanted to step back from the data that we've showed you here and say kind of what are the real headlines that we get out of our review of this over the last six months. Um, one important factor is that contract spending in the Department of Homeland Security is relatively stable. Most of the fluctuation comes in natural disaster driven events through spending by the Federal Emergency Management Administration. Um, over the seven years that the department's been in existence, uh, the most growth has occurred in contracting in services contracts. There's been slower growth in products. Using 04 as the starting point, there's actually been a decrease in spending in R&D, especially if you take out the R&D dollars spent on management services as opposed to uh, what we call actual research and development. 
Um, but one of the things that really strikes you as you look at the funding stream at the Department of Homeland Security, unlike other national security agencies, most of the national security agencies have had significant increases in their total overall spending in the decades since 9-11. Right. The Department of Homeland Security has not. As a result, our conclusion is they don't actually have the same cushion to, to be ready for the coming drawdown in spending that's going to be occurring over the next few uh, years. And we anticipate that that will hit DHS as well as every other agency. And the starting point, if you will, doesn't benefit from the growth in the er earlier decade of, of this century. And I think from a DHS planning and from a contractor thinking point of view, that's an important element to keep in mind. Uh, there's high levels of competition in contract awards, and those levels are growing. Um, it will remain a very competitive environment, especially taking in mind that the budget will be coming down. Um, an increased reliance on fixed price contracts, an increased use of definitive contracts are trends that we see, and we think those trends will continue on into 11 and beyond. And a dramatic reduction in the use of purchase orders. Uh, so those of you who depend on purchase order contracts, um, still plenty of money flowing through there, uh, but less and less uh, with each passing year. Um, pretty consistent distribution of contract dollars, as you saw in the previous chart, among small businesses, medium-sized businesses, and large businesses. And here again, it's useful to draw a distinction with the Defense Department. Less than 20 percent of Defense Department prime contract dollars go to small businesses. 30 percent of the Department of Homeland Security goes to small businesses. The Small Business Administration gives DHS an A. It's not easy to get an A from SBA. And, uh, and I think from the point of view of uh, going forward, that's going to be to continue to be an emphasis inside. We didn't see a lot of surprises in the top 20 companies. Um, there is a growing overlap with defense companies. Again, that's not a surprise. You would also see that change almost immediately in the event of a substantial, expensive national disaster. And, uh, and actually, the dollars that are piling up already this year um, are, are potentially going to affect those top 20 uh, when those data come out or well. That's kind of where we end up here. Um, I think we'll pause at this point. Uh, we'll be glad to take questions from you. Uh, for those of you who are on the web, uh, you should, if you have the screen, you can see my, uh, my email. Uh, if not, I'll tell you it's dbertau at csis.org. And don't forget the second E, or it will get a bounce back. Um, for those of you here in the room, we've got some microphones, and if you'll raise your hand, we'll, uh, we'll bring a mic to you. Uh, if you would please identify yourself and your affiliation, and then uh, you can ask your question and go on from there. All right, let's start here on, on my left. Uh, Ken Oscar from Floor Corporation. Two comment questions. The first is, you didn't put it in your summary comments, but it appears that there's a a shift from single award IDIQs to multiple award, which really gives rise to continuous competition, which is, could be looked at as a good thing. Second comment is I was rather surprised to see the ratio of, of grants to contracts, especially during the hurricane years. It, it seems to me that two of the big triggers were the Iraq War and Katrina that gave rise to a lot of criticism from, from people and investigations by Congress and criticism of the federal government and how they were contracting. But in reality, looking at this data, there weren't that many Katrina contracts. Uh, and that maybe Relative. the observations were more state contracts, but the criticism was laid to the federal government and cause kind of a shift in the pendulum from acquisition reform to other uh, uh, phenomena that has happened in the last few years. I think those are both excellent comments, Ken. Um, there, there has been, as you see on, uh, on the chart, chart 16, uh, an increase in the use of multiple awards. And, and I think that reflects both here and in the competition uh, statistics, and it, it will reflect in the competitive nature of, of uh, the business going forward. Um, I also think it puts a, an emphasis on the Department of Homeland Security to have a better idea of what it is seeking in its solicitations. Uh, 
uh, because, as you know, it's very difficult to get uh, decent responses to a competitive uh, uh, award under, under a multiple award if you don't have a good idea of what you're asking for. It's really hard to discriminate from one to the other. Um, and there's, a, I think, a, a pretty strong emphasis of that inside some parts of DHS. Your comments about, uh, uh, about the Katrina impact, I think, are, are both worth sort of reflecting on for a minute. Um, one is that we, we actually, if it's federal money, it looks to the general public as if it must have been a contract, regardless of whether it's a federal contract competed and awarded by the federal government or a contract funded by a federal grant and awarded by a subsidiary uh, state or local or other, or other activity. And I think it, it, it really merits a considerable additional uh, study uh, because the performance under grants, and if you look at the amount of money spent by the U.S. government on grants, it's almost as large as the $400 billion spent under contracts. And it has nowhere near the environment, either in terms of, of oversight and regulation or in terms of data gathered to be able to track and analyze. And, uh, and I think it's one of the, one of the under-recognized areas where good government should really penetrate we, uh, and, and spend a little more time on. But with respect specifically to Katrina, as we looked at the data and we looked at the contracts, um, we didn't find anywhere near the amount of, of questions, if you will, of looking at something and saying, that doesn't make any sense. There's actually a pretty good logic between the contracts are awarded the type of award that was put into place, because actually in an emergency, you're not going to go through a nine-month cycle of developing a draft statement of work and having an industry day and going through three cycles of the process and have a competitive award. You're going to find the best guy to do the job immediately because lives are at stake. All right? I think what FEMA has done in the intervening years post-Katrina is a pretty good job of pre-competing contracts that will be in place and will be used in the event of, of a disaster. And I think the results that you would see, and God hope that we don't actually ever see that up here, but in the event there is another big Katrina-sized operation, I think you'll see a very different result in terms of both the competitive nature of the contracts and the type of business that flows through those contracts. So I think there are some lessons learned there. Whether they'll stand up to the test of reality, we'll have to see. So I think there was another question here in the middle. Yeah, I'm Charlie Clark with Government Executive Magazine. Uh, could you analyze a little more the uh, increased concentration of contracting done out of the Secretary's office? Is that a function of uh, Janet Napolitano's style or just sort of uh, consolidating the agency more? Yeah, let me, let me comment a couple, and then, Guy, you may have an additional thing. Um, the billion dollars in growth between 09 and 10, I, I think almost 900 million of that was contracts related to the Federal Protective Service, um, which was about the same amount of dollar value before. It just was uh, distributed uh, by each agency that had it rather than concentrated in one uh, activity, if you will. It was, it was under ICE, I think, before right. uh, being reorganized and reshuffled under, under the Office of the Secretary. Um, there is, though, I think, an increasing tendency, and I, I don't know if I would uh, uh, characterize it as solely the, um, the venue of the current team that's in place of, of DHS-wide IT support contracts. And uh, whereas before each agency or each component was generating its own IT support or buying its own IT support, uh, we've got a couple of examples uh, where uh, you now have a DHS-wide contract and it's managed by and the obligated dollars are associated with the Office of the Secretary. We actually didn't find, Charlie, that it was an indication of greater centralization or concentration of management authority. It's, uh, it's more the way in which the uh, contracts are, are tracked. Um, I think there is a better integration of the management of the contracts, if you will, um, but that's more from a contract management, a contract administration point of view, uh, not from an, an execution at the end game. So, um, got one in, in front here. Good morning, George Nicholson from Stratcorp. A question when you talked about your chart, DHS contracting spending by competition, and you had the category competition with multiple offers. Do you break that out? Has it gone from one to two offers, from one to 20 offers? And along the same line in your chart, DHS contractors in 2005 and 2009, listing the largest contractors, do you have any kind of breakdown of saying, among these ranking and stacking, the largest contractors, how much is R&D, how much is procurement, or how much is in services? 
Uh, great questions both. Uh, on the competition one, um, multiple offers actually means two or more. Uh, and we can, we can get to, to additional levels of granularity counting the number of offers between two and however many uh, and, and put a, a stack on each bar for, for the number of contracts uh, or the number of contractors competing. But we, we figured as long as there were more than two or two or more, that, that counted as multiple and was good enough for us. That meant real competition. Uh, if it's, if it's uh, labeled in FPDS as competed, but there's only one bidder, Yes, it's technically competed, but in terms of industrial base and, and, and contracting uh, uh, policy, that, that has different implications. Um, David, I don't know if you yeah, want to say I, I, that. George, actually, I, I'll, I'll tell you, um, I actually think it would be worth knowing what the trend year over year of average or sort of, you know, uh, uh, average number of, of bids per competed contract with multiple offers. Um, we all know that a competition with two is very different than a competition with five. And, uh, and I think from a long-term competitive environment, that's a, a useful data point to know. So I'm going to point to Greg and say, we're going to actually run this data and see how hard it is to, uh, to come up with the sort of uh, what that average is over time and whether that average is increasing. Because it isn't just the total number of, of uh, contract actions and dollars competed, it's the amount of competition actually in, inside that. And I think that's a very worthwhile uh, additional analytical objective for us to undertake here. So thank you. And then on the, the issue of the, the top 20 contractors, we've, or, or the large contractors, uh, we, we capped it at 20, but we can cap it at any other number. Um, we, we have done the breakout of top 20 for each of the other, uh, the, the three uh, category, categories, products, services, and R&D. Um, there, is, there is a lot of variance, obviously, between the two. Uh, there's also a lot of, uh, of uh, spread, if you will, in terms of, um, again, there's not a concentration of any particular uh, category, product services, R&D, um, into you know, a small number of companies. There's a pretty good uh, uh, spread in each of these categories uh, where the money is, is allocated uh, relatively uh, uh, well across um, a number of companies. Um, for R&D, for example, I think when we, we did that top 20 list, that was where we were most surprised because you really don't see any almost concentration in, in, that, uh, in that category. Uh, again, we live primarily in the defense world where we do see a lot of concentration. I think the top four or five R&D contractors for DOD capture about 75% of the R&D market. Uh, in DHS, you weren't there even with the top 20 or 30. So. Um, I, I, I think I, we have the data. We can break it out uh, uh, in, those, in those ways as well. You may have been asking a different question, though. If I look at the $450 million in obligated dollar value that I have associated with IBM at the top of the, of the top 20 chart, um, what you may be saying is what percentage of that was awarded under contracts that competed with multiple offers? and similarly with others. We have not broken the data down that way by company. It's not easy to do. Many of these companies have multiple DUNS numbers, in some cases more than 100. Uh, we've got to track those back, not out of the federal procurement data system, but we've got to actually go look at uh, uh, the uh, contract data itself, and it's pretty time consuming. Um, I think that would be a marvelous project to undertake, uh, but it's probably outside the bounds of our current uh, ability to do that. Um, but if you know somebody who'd be willing to fund that kind of a review, I think it would be an excellent project to undertake. Well, what we can do, of course, are, and, and that's the third element, is for every company in the database, say, how much of their contracting dollars went to uh, product services R&D. So that we can do. Wait for the mic, if you would, so folks at home can hear you. Quick addition. In terms of maintaining the industrial base, it would seem that for a company, if I can invest in R&D or I can predict, invest in products, that's going to be more beneficial to maintaining the industrial base than uh, in, uh, investing in services. That's an interesting, that's an interesting perspective. Um, I don't have an analytical basis to agree with it today, but I'll, I think that's worth taking under consideration. The manufacturing industrial base, for sure. Right. Uh, the industrial base as a whole. A any, other, uh, any other questions or comments, reactions? Ah, got one here in the front. 
uh, Noor Hassan, L3 Communications. It's interesting, one of the last charts you, you showed was looking at small, medium, and large size businesses. And the distribution has been pretty consistent uh, over the last four years. I've worked primarily in DOD, and what we've seen is an increase in small business set-asides. And even when you have a full and open competition, we have pretty stringent small business requirements, up to 35% of total contract value, something we've been dealing with a lot. So you, when you mention that medium-sized firm shrinkage, a lot of that is the fact that medium-sized firms, once they pass that $7 million size standard or $25 million dollar size standard, um, they're finding it more and more difficult to swim in the same water with companies like mine. We're going after the same work and there's no benefit to them. Do you see or have you heard about any kind of initiative to increase uh, small business set aside that might alter this in the coming years? Because that's really where we've seen that shift in, in DOD. Norm, that's a, that's a complex question. I think uh, uh, your reflection of the data are accurate, and I should have noted one of the other elements of our data limitations here. This is chart 19. Um, you know, we only have small business dollars here where the small business is the prime. That's right. Every prime contractor who's not a small business does have a small business objective to, to meet as a percentage of its dollars as well. So the total dollars were flow, flowing to small businesses um, include subcontractor dollars from primes. However, that's offset to some degree by the fact that many of the prime dollars flowing to the small businesses under this chart are subcontracted to a larger company who is a subcontractor to the small business in the set-aside award. Um, I don't know whether those two competing data elements end up offsetting themselves. I suspect there's a fair amount of parity in, involved in there, uh, but I haven't done the investigation to be able to reflect that. But I, so, so I think there's, there's some, some squishiness, if you will, to the overall conclusions you can draw. The points you make, number one, that for companies that just graduate from small business, it's a very different competitive environment. This is a very tough challenge. And, uh, and it's a, a challenge that is being met in part uh, by the government through mentor-protege programs to sort of help companies uh, uh, prepare for that sort of thing. Ultimately, um, a competitive environment, particularly in a situation like we have now where the potential of, of D-Day coming um, is, uh, default day that is, is, uh, is growing, uh, you know, nearer on any given day and where companies may be asked to live on their cash for an extended period of time. Um, obviously, the larger a company is, uh, uh, the better chance it has to have accumulated enough cash to be able to do that, and small companies have a much tougher time there. I'm not aware of any substantial policy debate internally of changing the boundaries, if you will, uh, so that the dynamic that you see today is going to be very different going forward. Um, I'm, I, I think there have been some discussions about increasing the threshold for small business. Um, I think those discussions will be played out in the fullness of, of uh, public comment, uh, and there are plenty of public comments coming into play. But ultimately, all you're really doing is redrawing a line slightly. The dynamic itself doesn't fundamentally change. I also think there's been some discussion about whether there's any policy implications to the impact on, on middle-sized companies, if you will. And there are two big difficulties there. One is it, it doesn't make any sense to create a second set-aside, if you will, for non-small but not big companies because you'd spend all your time fighting over what that meant and what the boundaries would be. Um, uh, the other element that's anecdotally quite powerful but analytically hard to prove is that a lot of the new technology, a lot of the innovation comes from these middle-sized companies. And, uh, and as that's a popular view. Uh, when we've looked at that analytically, it's difficult to quantify that in any way, shape, or form. The reality is, though, that there are some who succeed. They start small, they grow middle-sized, they eventually get big. And so you can't say that there's an ironclad barrier to success that's in place here. And I think that fundamentally the policies that the government has are designed, among other things, to both encourage and to reward uh, those companies as they succeed going forward. And I don't see any reason uh, from my perspective to try to undermine or change that policy. One interesting thing that strikes me here is that, uh, and, and we've done that for the, the DOD work, uh, and the professional services work is since we track the mergers and acquisitions uh, in a particular market um, for the sake of just knowing which 
a small company was bought by a larger one and therefore rolling up that company's revenues from federal contracts into the larger company's revenues. Um, we've, we've produced these, uh, uh, what we find to be very useful, uh, sort of pitchfork charts that show uh, sort of the, the M&A trends for, for a particular uh, market. Um, we, haven't, we haven't taken the, the time to do that for, for DHS, but I think that would be an interesting and relatively uh, a simple exercise, just capture in sort of a, a more visually pleasing uh, way the, the uh, M&A activity that we've tracked anyway. Um, I think that might tell a very interesting story for DHS that might be very different from DOD, where you've really seen uh, the big players very active in, in, in M&A. I don't know how, how true that would be for DHS. I suspect there would be a lot more small and medium-sized companies that have remained uh, sort of independent and have not been targeted. Um, before we take any more questions from the floor, I want to remind our viewers on the web, if you want to send a, a question, you can send it by email. I've gotten a couple, but I don't like them, so I'm not going to answer them. <laughs> no. Um, they're, they're, they've, they actually replicate questions that have already been raised here, and so uh, they're, they're just basically a, a repeat of questions we've already uh, raised here. Uh, we've got one more question here in the front, uh, if you would, read. Uh, Adam Miles from Raytheon. Just a question. I know your focus has been looking at contract spending, but I'm wondering if you've thought about looking at the implications of non-contract spending on future contract spending. So, so what I'm getting at, and by way of example, is, is personnel costs. Mm -hmm. and, and when you look at the percentage of the total DHS budget that's personnel driven as opposed to, you know, that of DOD, right? It's a, it's a, it's a pretty different picture. So. And as you think about personnel growth, I, I'm wondering whether you, you have thought of or are interested in looking at what the implications of that are for, for future direction. Do you want to mention the work, the work in this regard as well? Yeah, this is uh, chart four uh, up on the screen here. Uh, Adam, I think that's a, that's a very fascinating question. Um, we have, it, it, you act, it's actually, if you compare this chart, the DHS chart of contract dollars to non-contract outlays, most of the variability is in the non-contract part, if you will, of DHS on, on, on this chart. Um, the opposite is true for the Defense Department, where most of the variability is actually in contract dollars. And the non-contract outlays, um, we actually, uh, if you go back and normalize the data to constant fiscal year $10, uh, the difference of non-contract outlays in FY90 and FY10, so a 20-year span in DOD, is less than 1%. It's almost identical for the non-contract dollars. Most of that is obviously civilian pay, military pay and benefits, and associated expenses on, on that side and what the DOD spends on itself. Um, the difference, of course, is that the Defense Department is an is a agency that largely does spend on itself. It consumes and manages what it spends on. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security has some elements of that. The Coast Guard actually is very much like DOD in terms of what it, what it buys, it uses. But much of the rest of DHS, both in the contract area and in the non-contract outlays, there's a customer who's outside the department. And that's very, very different than the Defense Department. I think analytically it'd be worth looking at. Um, I have no idea what we would see in that regard. Uh, and I particularly think it's going to be interesting as part of the staging, if you will, for the, for the drawdown that we're going to see coming over the next couple of years. So I'm grateful to you for, for that comment. In fact, I, I would note, uh, unless there are any other questions, um, what has happened here this morning is you have already dramatically uh, increased our workload uh, in terms of uh, preparing for the next cycle here. We value that highly. I think the interaction that we get from you and the feedback we get from you both in an event like this and in subsequent discussions that we have uh, is, is the heart of our work because ultimately, um, while this is a lot of fun just in and of itself, its real value is whether or not it's of any use to you guys as you, uh, as you wrestle with your day-to-day -day responsibility. Uh, because we think this is a, a new view of looking at things. It's a way of collecting the data and showing it um, that, is, uh, it, it, that is useful as well as analytically interesting. And obviously the kinds of feedback and comments we get for you of what else would be helpful here is good for us. So we will leave here and at 10.30 we'll start working on next year's report. <laughs>
<laughs> so I, I want to thank you all for your contributions, your participation this morning, and your continued involvement and engagement with us as we go forward. Thank you very, very much.